that uh, links <coughs> agriculture to financial technologies. So what we do is we are building a commodity exchange market, which is relatively new in Kenya. And uh, we provide uh, farmers with access to storage, well equipped their houses, so that they can keep their produce until they can get a customer who can buy it at a good price, at a reasonable price. And then at the same time, uh, they can be able to access loans if they need it at any time. And uh, also they can trade on agricultural commodity platform. So basically it's like a stock market, but now for agricultural commodities, for agricultural goods, yeah, where you buy and sell commodities because uh, the prices of different agricultural produce usually fluctuates from time to time. Yeah. Mm. So how did you come about Radava? Uh, so it started in 2021. I was fresh from university. I studied telecommunications engineering, uh, but then now there was this program called Jesuit Talent Investor. So when I saw it and I was job hunting, I thought it's 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 a good opportunity for me to try something. And. Um, and therefore, uh, I, I applied to join the program and that's when we were trained on how to start businesses. And I, I met also, I have a co-founder, Isaac and Ivan. So we came together and then uh, we were actually, we did a market research and then we found out that there is a great gap in the agricultural market sector. Um, like, I'm, I'm just trying to think what you studied versus what you're doing, the relationship mm -hmm. is, is quite vast. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Okay, uh, so um, it's very different from telecommunications engineering. Mm -hmm. I studied it, but I did not practice it, save for the internships. Uh, but then at uh, the same time as it's the skills that I gained doing engineering now helps me as the chief technology officer for Radava because I can understand technology and I'm well equipped to serve as its chief technology officer. Yeah, but uh, in terms of relations, no, not at all. I, I took a different path after graduation. Um, I'm interested. Why, why did you not follow through what you studied in campus? Okay. I mean, uh, uh, how many how many years do you, did you spend um, studying for your degree in Jequat? Uh, in Jequat, I was at Jequat, uh, so I studied for five years telecommunications engineering. You know, initially my mm -hmm. dream was to become a journalist. Yeah, uh, but then now I had um, in class six, seven, the teacher noticed I have some form of hearing problem. And so I got really worried that, that um, I may be in front of people taking um, press statements and then I write something that is not it. Because when you compare my notes in high school, primary school, it was very different from what the teacher was dictating. Yeah, so that made me worried. So I thought uh, of going towards the back, doing the back end, like engineering is more of uh, uh, the wires, just uh, helping in the te telecommunications landscape from the background. Yeah, but then uh, it wasn't exactly my passion. So when the opportunity, uh, to jump ship offered itself, I did. <laughs> and that's how I began doing business, yeah. Interesting. So what, wh how, how has the journey been building Radava to where it is right now? How, I, I, you said you started Radava in 2021. So yeah. it's, it's about, uh, let's say two, three years? Uh, two years. Two years? Yeah. yeah. So how has, the biz how has the journey been growing mm. Radava from zero days or one day <laughs> to two years, you know. Very challenging. Uh, at first, it was extremely exciting to start something new, to make, um, come up with a business that is helping people. It was very exciting. But then now you have these days when nothing is making sense. Uh, sometimes maybe it's the funding that you're not getting. Other times it's the um, customers that you have to deal with. Uh, just very, very challenging at some time, but I'm grateful for my team uh, because the team, I, I believe uh, the people who have kept me going so far, um, they are incredibly amazing. So um, 
The journey has been with a lot of challenges, uh, but also we had our up and down. And um, the most uh, fulfilling thing about it is the fact that you are making a difference in the lives of farmers yeah, in Kenya. So you deal with um, what scale of farmers? Uh, we deal with uh, grains, farmers who deal with grains and cereals so that you can be able to store their produce over a period of time. Mostly it's up to one year, but uh, because the kind of farmers we are targeting are those who deal with cereals, which are um, staple foods in the country and in the region, which includes maize, wheat, rice, sorghum, millet, and beans yeah because of their demand so they they go fast the, those are the kind of customers uh, that we target uh, the spotholder farmers we we um you've, you've mentioned that and then i've remembered um uh, you lately um of course you know the discussion that has been happening in terms of uh, the prices of uh, the commodities going high in terms of um Maze, actually, like I think a week or two ago, I was, I was, mm. I was, I was mm. watching news and, you know, farmers were complaining that uh, the government and the, the subsidies and everything that is happening. Now, how does that affect um, your business with the farmers, especially particularly with the fluctuating cost of inflation? Uh -huh. Okay, uh, so that is why we are here. We actually hedge the farmers against the price risk because uh, for agricultural commodities, commodities are goods, agricultural goods, uh, the price usually fluctuates from time to time. Like for example, in the beginning of the year, you can find that a bag, a 90 kilogram bag of maize sells for like 2,600, but then when uh, sometime in June, it comes to about uh, 5,400, so there's a big fluctuation which also affects um, people which you can see with the rising prices of food uh, so what you do the farmer is usually the one who is most affected because uh, at the harvest season when everybody is harvesting uh, the maize because the seasons are the same so if every farmer is harvesting what they do is that they rush to the market because um, they have been holding on to their produce from the time um, from the planting harvesting slowly waiting and then now they have harvested so their first instinct is to sell it to the market so but the problem is that because everybody is harvesting at that time so the prices are really down and um, they are like depressed prices so uh, they, when they consider the revenue that they get from selling their produce, it's different from the, the, the amount of money they invested through the planting, harvesting, yeah, all, all that period. So what we do, we give them a place where they can store the agricultural produce until they can find, it can fetch a better price for them. So they can hold on to it a little longer uh, until they can find a customer who can buy it at a good price. And also, um, we have a, a category of customers we call um, institutions. So these are people who require large supply of grains. Uh, so let's say like schools, they usually set their budget at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of a term. So uh, when at that time, when they calculate their price, they say like uh, this amount we shall keep like 500,000 towards food. But then now what happens in June, is that the prices have gone up, so they could spend over 900,000. So what they do, uh, they come to us, the service that we offer, so they buy, uh, we give them receipts, which is issued by the Warehouse Receipt System Council. This is a Kenyan government body that ensures, uh, that certifies warehouses where we, we keep goods. So this receipt, they can just uh, come uh, buy at the beginning of the year and keep withdrawing the cereals and grains anytime of the year. Um, yeah, so it hedges them against the price fluctuation like that. Okay, you've mentioned something about um, categories of, of the people you do business with. One of them was institutions, right? Mm -hmm. What are the other categories you mm -hmm. deal with? Okay, we have three categories uh -huh. of customers. The first ones are the farmers, mm -hmm. the smallholder farmers, who deal with grains and cereals. For these people um, category, they are like our prime customers. So we give them access to storage and help them to get a good market. Yeah, uh, so they can sell their produce at a price that they consider worthy and relevant. And then uh, we have the second category, that's the institutions. Yeah, so these are people like prisons, schools, just uh, uh, 
yeah, institutions that require large supply of grains and cereals. Yeah. Kamagideri. Schools make gideri mm -hmm. every day. Yeah, so they require that one. So they are the ones who uh, actually are the customers to the farmers. So we hedge them against price fluctuation by the fact that they can buy and then uh, we they can withdraw at any time. So they lock in the price at a certain time, like if they buy in January and then uh, with that, the price of January. So they have the receipt and they can withdraw from the warehouse at any time throughout the year. And then now we have, uh, we hedge them against that, the price risk. And then we have this institutional, um, individual and institutional investors. These are people who are not, not necessarily interested in the day-to-day -day operations of agriculture, but they want to benefit from it so what they do is they, they invest in our plat in our commodity exchange platform so it's available at rx.radaba.co so that that one works like a stock market where you can buy during uh, when the prices are a bit low then you sell it again when the prices are a bit high so in between that period you can gain um a profit out of it and yeah but the um the the thing you're buying is backed in our warehouse so you can either withdraw if you want to or you can like uh, sell it to someone else by transferring the receipt to someone else like me to you so now the goods come to you again and you don't have to worry about the storage because we handle all of that mm -hmm. yeah those are the three categories that you serve right now interesting um you mentioned something again that I'd want I'd want to pick up and ask uh, two things. Let me start with uh, the first one. We have seen um, when. Let me give an example with when President Uhuru was mm -hmm. in uh, was in power, and he gave a subsidy for commodities. You know where he gave unga at I don't know ninety shillings. So I, I can't remember well how much unga was retailing for because unga had gone quite high and then he gave it he gave it quite a huge amount of a subsidy i would say mm -hmm. so that time farmers we had a problem with farmers um hiding their mm -hmm. their 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 unga because they were like we bought this we the cost of producing this particular bale of uh, unga or a particular bale of uh, ma maize was, was quite high and now you're giving it out at a subsidy. How does that affect you? That was the first question. The other one I'll ask when you're, when you're done with this one. Mm, for us, that um, it plays a role, uh, especially, but um, the question will be where the subsidy came from. So from the government, they also buy from the farmers at some time, uh, but then uh, that is not enough. Actually, there are times when there is um, the produce in the um, in the country, it's not enough, especially maize. So what uh, people dealing in this sector, like us, uh, we do is uh, importation from Zambia coming through Tanzania. Yeah, to, to, to meet the demand of the food insecurity. Uh, because uh, the, uh, the amount of maize uh, or beans or uh, the cereals that's produced, sometimes it's just not enough for the entire country. So <coughs> when that happens, normally um, people in this sector usually resort to importing, importing uh, the grains and the cereals, then selling it. Uh, but then now, consider if the farmer had uh, like kept their grains a little bit, so now not all the grains that are produced um, during the harvest season are sold immediately to the market. That's why we give them a place to hold on to it. So that not only gives them uh, the hedge against the price risk, but it also ensures that um, the country is food secure because now somebody can choose to sell in this different month, this different months, ensuring that uh, we have a uh, supply throughout the year. Yeah, so um, it's, it's affected our business in the form of uh, the, the scarcity, the scarcity of the commodities. So you could see the warehouses were empty completely. Uh, but um, the other result was um, like importing, importing the grains from other nations. Yeah. So, so you help farmers import. Um, in or what role do you play in that? And not the farmers, because at that time they have already sold their produce. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, just to supply the people who need the product. Yeah, not exactly the farmers. But if the farmer wants to, like, uh, get the grains, yeah, we can help them with that one too. 
in, in your opinion or uh, with your years of experience, what are some of the challenges facing smallholder farmers? Uh, the challenge yes is um, the most um, is uh, the fact that um, uh, most of them are in the interior of the country so reaching out to them has been a little bit of a problem especially the ones who don't have access to phones or yeah so but what we have tried to do is reaching out through the cooperative unions because most of the farmers are part of cooperative society and then the other challenge is adoption of technology a little uh, because we also facilitate knowing that this farmer wants to sell when they contact us using uh, means either phone or yeah uh, that has been a little bit of a challenge and then um, the other one is convincing the farmer that they can actually hold on to their produce and that they will get a better price out of it what they want to do is just see the money now 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 mm -hmm. and then yeah but now 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 is giving you a price that is lower than what you'll have gotten if you held on to your produce a little bit longer uh, yeah so w when 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 you tell them to hold on to their produce a little mm -hmm. bit longer mm -hmm. what does that mean for the market? I mean, what does that mean for us consumers mm -hmm. when, when you tell farmers to hold on to their produce? Uh, it means that you still have the supply. It means uh, you'll have a supply of um, the agricultural produce throughout the year. Because um, if imagine if the farmers sold at the same time, like all the food was rushed into the market at the same time. Like, so by the end, right now we are in August, by September, the entire grain uh, in Asia, it has um, com finished, yeah. yeah. And then now what happens from that time? Because uh, the, the planting seasons are in seasons, and but some need the, the planting season hasn't even yet begun, the harvesting uh, as you wait. So now that causes now the scarcity of the commodity, which causes the food, the food prices to, to, to rise up. Yeah, but then now if they like released in portions, in portions, in portions, it's actually hedging you as the final consumer against that uh, price fluctuation. Ah, uh, yeah, that's what it means to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, 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 I, now I get it because I'm wondering once they hold back, how how is the how are we the consumers or rather them uh, you know the normal people that is wanjiko and, and the rest how they're able to what's the cycle how what's the cycle looking like but now i'd want to i'd want to ask um to ask you now a question um how many people do you work with in radava oh at radava so far we are seven full-time uh, but uh, during the harvest season, especially because uh, many farmers are bringing in their grains and cereals, we hire casually up to around 30 on a casual basis. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but you're hoping to grow a team because the market um, is demanding also as we grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how as your, you being a woman in... I don't want to call it a male-dominated uh, mm -hmm. arena, but the society is yet to embrace women doing, for lack of a better word, hard, you know, hard or difficult tasks. Mm -hmm. How has your position as a woman uh, impacted the sector you, uh, you are in? Mm, that is a good question. Um, hmm. The good thing is that uh, me as a woman, I've always been in a male-dominated thing, beginning with my course, which I studied. We were around 10 ladies in our class. We, we are of about 50. <laughs> so I got to hmm, build my strength over there. <laughs> uh, in our engineering class, we were 10 ladies in a class of 50. So I um, understood that one. But uh, yeah, the commodities market is majorly male-dominated. Uh, so what I have to tell myself always is that I can do it and uh, also to believe in yourself yeah and not to see like uh, you know sometimes when you try to see obstacles you can actually see them so like I just do my thing and if people are judging or something uh, that's now that's their path for me uh, I'm just focusing on what I need to do what I need to get done yeah but uh, sometimes there are like stereotypes like a woman uh, I think you should get 
yeah, <laughs> something more masculine. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Have you but, met? Uh, so far, I've had a good support system. Uh, they support my ideas, beginning with my father and also my co-founders. Uh, they are amazing, and they give me the um, uh, the platform to keep shining and encouraging. Yeah, so it keeps me going. At least the people in my inner circle support me. Yeah, so now the outer circle, uh, I can deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find yourself like probably uh, men fearing to approach you because of the career <laughs> path you've chosen and the work you do? <laughs> ah, hmm. I think so. <laughs> That's why I'm single, right? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Mm, uh, but the good thing is that I don't mind. I don't mind. I am a woman. I am powerful. Yeah. And I keep uh, like breaking those cats, glass ceilings. So it's a good thing for me. And um, yeah, the right one will come along, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Who won't be intimidated by you, of course. Yeah. So what are some of um, the challenges you've experienced in your line of work? Uh, as a woman? No, just generally. Uh, generally. Um, in terms of business, um, the challenge of majorly faced is fundraising. Uh, it's like uh, really, really difficult. Although we have managed to raise some money from uh, one investor actually, two, yeah. Yeah, but um, fundraising is very difficult because this field is capital intensive and our competitors are raising in their um, hundreds of millions. Yeah, so uh, that has hindered uh, the progress, the pace at which we are moving. And the other one is um, the government regulations because um, the field we are operating in in agricultural commodities is highly regulated by the government. So we have to just find a way to navigate and keep tabs with what's happening. Yeah, so, so that one uh, is a bit of a challenge. And uh, finally, uh, the other challenge is uh, climate change, let me say that, uh, because of unpredictable weather patterns affecting the farmers, it also um, determines the kind of yields that they get. Uh, that's a bit of a challenge as well. So what are some of the um, lessons you've picked along the way um, as you do business? Mm -hmm. uh, the lessons I've learned, um, first, it's good for a business person, it's good to have a co-founder. At least uh, they keep things going. Uh, at first, uh, Redover is not the first business I began. So I previously had another one called uh, Subscribers. I did it alone and uh, yeah, it didn't pan out. But uh, when I got, when especially when you get a good co-founder, things are becoming very like much, much easier. But because you, you can be in multiple places at once by sending your co-founder is doing this as I am doing the interviews. So they can keep the business going as you do something else, yeah. And um, I've also learned to ask for help when you need it, uh, not to be afraid of asking for help, especially from people who have been through it before. Uh, not only does it show humility, but it's, it's an easier way of uh, navigating the business world. And uh, that also means leaning on mentors. Mentors are very important. They help you to, to grow faster and to avoid the things otherwise you will have like crushed right on. Yeah, that's if you follow their advice. And lastly, to believe in yourself. Yeah, that's very important. And just to find a way of encouraging yourself, especially for the low moments. Uh, you know, entrepreneurship is usually like a crown with uh, glamorous. Yeah, but we took a ground in different. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very tough. So you have to find a way of encouraging yourself. Just to have a strong support system and that will keep you going when um, when nothing is making sense at all uh, those are some of the lessons i've learned yeah and also to keep trending what's happening in the market that's very important for every entrepreneur so you can evolve uh, um, as as the market changes so you can change fast with it if you do not you might miss out on market opportunities or my, you might uh, get uh, behind let behind yeah now that um, you have a background in communication, marketing, and uh, technology, do you offer communication um, or rather marketing strategy to your clients? Uh, I repeat yeah. the question. Okay. So um, now that you 
ha, uh, have done, or rather you studied communication marketing, you know something in communication marketing and technology, do you, I, do you give your clients a communication or other marketing strategy? Mm. For like, uh, it depends. For, for the uh, institutions, they, are, they just want to get that product. Uh, so for them, they don't need a marketing strategy. For, for the um, investors, the, uh, the institutional investors who are investing in the commodity exchange market, uh, marketing strategy, no, not, but we provide uh, real-time market information. So we provide them with the historical data of um, how the grains and cereals performed for the last four years, so they can see in form of graphs, so they can see how the trend is. Then with that, we advise them on uh, when is the right time to buy and when is the right right time to sell for if you are, you are going to get a good return. Yeah, so like that. Uh, for the farmers, we actually help them to get uh, the, the customers themselves, but we also provide them with uh, training on how to interpret the market. So the, the real-time market information, it shows them, uh, we have a system called price plot. So this one in, uh, in shows uh, real-time market information across the country for different grains and cereals. So we train them how to use that so they can know like maize in Nairobi at Nyamakima market, today it's going for this price. They can make informed decision if they want to sell. Uh, this is the, they can see how different markets are performing so they can simply sell it to, to this market instead of just trashing to their local market, which is usually the case, like crashing into the market that's there. Uh, we show them the prices across the country so they know if I sell my produce in Mombasa, right now I can get a better return compared to selling it here in Kitale. Uh, yeah. And also we reach out to them because we help them to find buyers. So when they have kept the produce in a warehouse, uh, we call them and uh, when we find a buyer, let's say uh, the farmer brought their produce and then they said, I'm not willing to sell less than 2,400 per bag. So we ensure that's recorded and we ensure that uh, when we get someone who is uh, willing to buy above that price, we call them and ask, yeah, we've got this person, they're buying at 2,600 or 2,800. Are you willing to sell? Yeah, like that. Oh, amazing, amazing. That's quite nice. Um, as we almost come to a conclusion of this, of this um, um, discussion, I'd want to ask, what are some of the current marketing trends happening in the agribusiness sector that you would mention? Marketing trends? Mm -hmm. Um, in our sector? Yes. Okay, so in the agricultural space, uh, the marketing trends has mainly been uh, in form of e-commerce, where there are many platforms that are coming up, where they're linking sellers to, to, to buyers. Uh, that's one, one thing. And then there's also the... Um, uh, there, there are also other um, businesses that are... Um, buying 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 directly from the farmer but then now the problem with that is they cannot buy everything from every farmer that's why we provide them with storage where they can hold on to it another trend is digital marketing which is very important yeah uh, the moment you put out you are selling this and then you amplify it with a page it's easy to especially on social media it's easy to get a customer yeah, but um, from what you have realized in most of them, uh, most of the farmers we reach out to are not on social media. Uh, the ones who are, are traders and middlemen uh, who usually try to buy from the farmers at really depressed prices. Yeah, so if a farmer can put their produce out there and amplify it in, on social media platforms like Facebook, especially Facebook and Instagram to some extent, but especially Facebook, it's easier for them to, to, get, to get a buyer. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So finally... <laughs> what are your what are your aspiration in terms of business and as a person your aspirations in terms of business and as a person my 
Yes, your future aspirations. Oh, Sorry, future yes, aspirations. your future aspirations. Okay, so uh, for Red Devil Mercantile, we are intending to um, reach out to 500,000 farmers, not just in Kenya, but in the whole of Africa, because what you're trying to do is connecting a chain of warehouses, not just in Kenya, but in East Africa and the whole of Africa, such that when the farmer deposits their grains and cereals in, uh, in um, the warehouse in Kitale, that's where we are primarily based, and then they get a buyer who is maybe in another country like Zimbabwe, the buyer can simply withdraw the same quality and quantity from the warehouse in Zimbabwe, yeah, by just showing the receipt that you offer digitally, yeah, so that uh, to, to enhance cross-border trade among the nations, that's one of our biggest goals, and also to... Um, that in this in the process to help them to get really amazing prizes for them and we are also intending to trade a lot of commodities uh, to be the market makers yeah, because this is in Kenya is relatively a new 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 field yeah and the players are very few so we want to be the market makers market makers are the people who are determining the market prices of different commodities and to be the reference point for agricultural commodities if somebody wants insights on how is maize doing how is this doing it is us that they are going to consider um, personally I intend to do my master's degree yeah, <laughs> and I hope by then Mr. Wright will have come. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. So Wright yeah. is coming. Mr. Wright is on the way. He's coming. <laughs> but thank you. Thank yeah. you for coming. Mm. I'd want you to use that camera to give us a parting shot and let us know where we can find you and your business online. Parting shot. Yes. Use that ah. camera. Potential to anyone who is hearing this is uh, just do it. Uh, whatever ideas you have, whatever um, thing you're working on or you've been thinking about, just start whatever step you find. Like uh, that's the first step for you. Just start. Uh, you'll, the steps become clearer as you move along. Uh, so just start. That's the most important step you'll ever take. And when you start, that's when the next steps are going to appear. So just do it and do it in confidence. You are going to make it. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine, for making time for sharing insights on um, agriculture, business. You know, it's, it's not every day that people get to have these discussions. We really appreciate what you're doing as a woman in that sector. Mm -hmm. And, you know, embracing, you know, your womanhood, your femininity, and just being able to deliver. Thank you. We appreciate you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. coming. That was Josephine Adeti, who is doing quite a lot in the agribusiness sector. And you've heard for yourself, there's quite a lot and there's a wide range of market that farmers can tap into. Now, that is what we had for you on Strength of a Woman, but don't touch that dial. Val is coming back with more. <laughs>